Greetings, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. If this is your first time here, and you're someone who enjoys listening to horror stories, join us by clicking subscribe down below. I upload new stories every single night. Please leave a like before we get started. Can we hit 500? Thank you. As I scrolled through Craigslist on that fateful day of Monday, June 2013, my mind was filled with thoughts of a much needed family holiday. My five children, ranging in age from five to 15, had been begging me for a vacation for months, and I could no longer deny them. I, Anna, the mum of the family, was determined to find the perfect holiday destination. As I clicked through the various advertisements, my eyes landed on a stunning holiday home in Florida. The photo showed a spacious and modern home, complete with a private pool and beach access. It seemed like a dream come true, and without hesitation, I clicked to book it after contacting the seller. My children, eager to join in on the holiday planning, gathered around me as I filled in our details and sent off $800 to the seller. I could already imagine the excitement on their faces as we explored the sunny beaches of Florida. Days passed, and with each passing moment, our excitement grew. We counted down the days until our holiday, making plans and creating a list of all the things we wanted to do while we were there. But, as the day of our departure drew near, something felt off. It wasn't until we arrived at the supposed address of our holiday home that we realized something was terribly wrong. The address led us to an empty plot of land, with no sign of a holiday home in sight. Panic began to set in as I frantically searched for any signs of the promised paradise. But there was nothing. The house simply did not exist. My children, who were now becoming increasingly restless, looked at me with confusion and disappointment. We had just driven hours in the car. I could feel my heart sinking as I realized that we had probably just been scammed. The thought of losing $800 was devastating, but even more so was a disappointment on my kids' faces. I quickly called the number listed on the advertisement, hoping for an explanation or a solution, but the person on the other end had no idea what I was talking about. Yep, they were pretending as if they thought this was legit. When we went to a different property, further along from the plot of land, we asked them what had happened, were there any holiday homes. According to them, the nearest holiday homes were around half a mile further up the coast. They informed me that the property was probably a scam, or some type of a fake ad had been put up to take my money and then fool me. After talking with those neighbours, I couldn't believe what had happened. How could someone be so heartless as to scam a family looking for a simple holiday? I felt helpless and angry, but I knew I had to keep it together for my kids. With no holiday home to stay in, we were forced to find alternative accommodation. We spent hours searching for a last minute rental, but everything was either too expensive or already booked. It seemed like our holiday dreams were shattered. But then, a glimmer of hope appeared. A kind couple, who owned a small bed and breakfast, offered to let us stay for a discounted rate. It wasn't the luxury holiday we had planned, but it was better than nothing. As we settled into our room, my children's excitement returned. They were thrilled to be on holiday, no matter where we were staying. I was watching them laughing and playing, 
I felt grateful. Even as we enjoyed our holiday, the thought of the scam continued to haunt me. Who could have done such a cruel thing, and why? As we were getting ready for bed on our last night, there was a knock at the door. I opened the door to find a man standing there, his expression serious and slightly intimidating. Are you the family who got scammed on Craigslist? He asked. I nodded, my heart racing with fear and suspicion. The man introduced himself as the owner of the holiday home. He explained that he had been receiving calls from multiple families who had also fallen victim to a similar scam just further up the coast. He said it was getting silly and at this point said he had contacted the police, but they had not been able to trace the culprits. He then proceeded to show me a printout after he printed the fake Craigslist advertisement. It had been taken down by Craigslist at this point, but the people kept creating new ones. My heart sank as I realized that the scammer was long gone and we would never get our money back. The family at the Airbnb often spoke to me and were telling me about how this was somehow normal for this area. I don't know how, but the man was surprising because what happens next is he offered us to stay in his Airbnb bed and breakfast for free and in future he offered us a discounted stay at his holiday home. He apologized profusely for the inconvenience and assured us that he would do everything in his power to prevent this from happening again. As we said our goodbyes, I felt relieved, huge amounts of gratitude and happiness towards this kind stranger. As we drove back home, I couldn't shake off the feeling that someone was out there trying to scam unsuspecting families like ours. Amidst all the chaos and disappointment, I was reminded of the true meaning of a family holiday. It wasn't about the luxurious accommodation or the fancy activities, but rather the time spent together making memories and overcoming challenges as a family. From that day on, we always make sure to double check any holiday bookings and we never fell for another Craigslist scam. Even though our holiday didn't go as planned, it brought us closer as a family and taught us an important lesson about trust and resilience. I decided to search for a driving instructor for my son Ethan. He had just turned 16 and was eager to learn how to drive. As a single mother, I wanted to make sure he had the best instruction possible. So I turned to Craigslist to find a reputable driving instructor. After scrolling through countless ads, I came across one that caught my eye. It was from a man who owned his own driving school he had over 30 years experience and had a high success rate with his students. I quickly contacted him and set up a driving lesson for Ethan that same evening. As I dropped Ethan off, I felt worried. I was so scared. This to me was like handing him over to the instructor. I needed to be careful but I also needed to stop being so overprotected. If Ethan was going to finally grow up and become an adult, then he would need to learn how to drive. As I waited for Ethan to finish his lesson back at home, I anxiously paced back and forth. After what felt like an eternity, I finally saw Ethan's car pull up on the driveway. He stepped out with a huge grin on his face and I felt a wave of relief wash over me. How was it? 
It was all right, Mum, Ethan said as he walked towards me. I smiled and asked him, So, what did you do? It went great, the instructor said. He even said that he wants to come back and learn more. I couldn't help but feel a sense of pride and excitement for my son. I was glad that he had found a good instructor who could guide him through his new chapter in his life. However, my joy was short-lived when I received a call after the second lesson. During the second lesson, Ethan went out earlier in the morning this time, a few days after his first lesson. He never returned home, and he was around an hour late. After trying to call his phone multiple times, he wasn't picking up. But, I received a call while sat in my living room. It was from the hospital. They told me that Ethan had been involved in a car accident during their lesson. My heart dropped, and I immediately rushed to the hospital. As I arrived in the emergency room, the scene before me was like a nightmare. Ethan was lying on a stretcher, his face bruised and his arm in a cast. Next to him was the instructor, also injured and unconscious. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. My son Ethan, who was smiling and full of life just a few hours ago, was now lying in a hospital bed because of an accident. The shock and fear overwhelmed me, and I could feel tears welling up in my eyes. The doctors informed me that Ethan had run a stop sign and collided with another car, causing both him and his instructor to be rushed to hospital. I couldn't believe it. How could this happen? The instructor was supposed to be an experienced instructor, and Ethan was a responsible and cautious driver. As I sat by Ethan's bedside, waiting for him to wake up, a rush of emotions fell over me. I was angry at the instructor for not properly teaching my son or using the emergency brake. I felt guilty for not protecting him or being there. I knew that after all this, he would be terrified if he woke up in this situation. When Ethan finally did wake up, he was disorientated and confused. I explained to him what had happened, and he just had a wave, or almost like a daze over him, where he wasn't fully there, but was still listening to me. He couldn't really remember anything from the accident, after me and fellow nurses tried to ask him about details. It was evident that he was traumatized by the experience. As for the instructor, he suffered a severe head injury and was actually placed into a coma. The remorse I felt for him was indescribable. He was just trying to do his job and now he was fighting for his life. The days that followed were a complete nightmare of hospital visits, police reports, and endless questions from concerned friends and family. When the instructor finally did wake up weeks later, we went to visit him in his room. He was still weak and disorientated, but he managed to apologize for what happened. He explained that he was trying to teach Ethan how to handle unexpected situations on the road, but in the process, he had underestimated the danger and caused the accident. I couldn't find it in my heart to blame him, not after what they had been through, but I also at the same time couldn't find it in my heart to forgive him for what had happened to my son and what he had been through. I knew that Ethan was traumatized by the accident, and would have a hard time getting back behind the wheel ever again. As we left the hospital, I could see the fear and anxiety in Ethan's eyes as we went to get in the car. Now, driving for him was like a nightmare. Driving was like a non-stop 24-7 panic attack on steroids. He was no longer the confident and eager teenager who couldn't wait to get his driver's license. 
The accident had taken its toll on him, and I knew it would take time for him to recover. Months went by, and with the help of therapy and support from our family, Ethan slowly regained his confidence and eventually overcame his fear of driving. We decided to go back to the instructor and thank him for his dedication with flowers and chocolates. We also learned that the accident had made him realize the importance of safety and responsibility as an instructor. There were no lawsuits, no hard feelings, and no arguments. We settled on fair and common ground. Looking back, I'm grateful that no one was seriously injured in the accident, as in killed or given permanent damage. The instructor recovered from his brain injuries, somehow. It was a wake-up call for both Ethan and me, and it taught us to never take anything for granted. And as for the instructor, he not only taught us how to drive, but also a valuable lesson in life. Wow, this mountain bike festival is so cool, my son yelled as I looked around at the bustling crowd of riders, vendors, and spectators. I told you it would be fun, my friend Dale replied with a wide grin. And you thought I was crazy for suggesting that we come here? I chuckled and shook my head. Dale had been trying to get me into mountain biking for years, but I always brushed it off as something I wasn't really interested in. After he showed me some videos of the festival and the incredible trails, I decided to give it a go one year and bring my son along with me. Hey dad, can we go check out the bikes? My 12 year old son Jack asked eagerly. Of course buddy, let's go see what they have to offer. I said, ruffling his hair affectionately. As we walked through the festival, we were surrounded by the sound of cheering and the smell of barbecue. We stopped at various booths, trying out different bikes and gear. The excitement was contagious, and I could see Jack's eyes lighting up with every new discovery. Hey guys, looking to get into mountain biking? A tall, muscular man asked us as we walked by his booth. Yeah, we're thinking about it, I replied. Well, you've come to the right place. I'm Rob and I've been riding for years. Let me give you some tips and advice, he said with a friendly smile. We spent the next half hour talking to Rob, who gave us valuable information about the different types of bikes, proper gear, and safety precautions. He even offered to take us on a trail ride later that day. Thank you so much, Rob. We'll definitely take you up on that offer, I said gratefully as we left his booth. No problem. It's always great to see new riders getting into the sport. Have fun, he called after us. As the day went on, we met more experienced riders who were more than happy to share their knowledge with us. We tried out different trails and even attempted some jumps and obstacles. Jack was having the time of his life, and I couldn't help but smile as I watched him. I think you're officially hooked on mountain biking, I said to Dale as we took a break. I told you it was addicting, he replied. As the sun began to set, we decided to call it a day and make our way back to the car. But before we left, we stopped by the main stage, where there was a raffle drawing for some incredible prizes. Come on, let's enter, Jack said excitedly, pointing to the raffle booth. Sure, why not, I shrugged, 
filling out a ticket. As we waited for the winners to be announced, I never thought that I would have got a mountain bike festival. It was a catalyst for my son and I to bond over in a new activity and setting. And the winner of the grand prize, a brand new mountain bike, is Jack, the announcer declared. My jaw dropped as Jack jumped up and down with excitement. I could see the determination in his eyes as he looked at me and said, Dad, we have to start biking now. I have to ride this bike. I couldn't say no to that kind of enthusiasm, so we made plans to go on our first official mountain biking trips the following weekend. And from that day on, we were both hooked. Thanks for coming with us, Dale. We had a blast, I said, patting him on the back as we walked to the car. Anytime, guys. It was great to see you both having so much fun. And don't forget, I'll be here to give you more tips and tricks anytime you need them, Dale replied with a smile. As we drove away from the festival, I couldn't wait to start our mountain biking journey. I never would have imagined a seemingly ordinary day at a festival would change our lives in such a significant way. Hey dad, do you think we can go back to this festival next year? Jack asked, eagerly from the back seat. Absolutely buddy, we'll make it a tradition, I promised, glancing back at him in the rearview mirror. As we drove into the sunset, we had made a new memory. We had created a new adventure, and, after all this, it made so much sense. When we finally got home, we realised that the bike was way too big for Jack. On top of that, it was way too small for me. There's a huge difference between myself and Jack's height, so I realised that I simply couldn't ride the bike, and neither could he. I ended up looking online to try and find alternatives. It's not like I paid for the bike after all, but Jack cried for around a whole day just because he couldn't ride it. No matter how low I made the seat, his legs and feet would never touch the pedals, which is a big no-no when it comes to biking. You have to fit on the bike properly, or there could be major accidents. I found a seller on Craigslist selling two mountain bikes. That's the thing, he wasn't even selling them, he was giving them away for free. Fast forward two weeks later, as I walked up to the door of Bay's 1013's house, yeah, weird name of the seller. After attending the mountain bike festival with my son, we had both caught the biking bug and I was determined to find us both our own bikes. I'd come across a post on Craigslist from a seller named Bayes103-1013, who was offering two mountain bikes for free. It seemed too good to be true, but after exchanging a few messages, he assured me that the bikes were in good condition, and I could take them for free, as long as I bought my truck to collect them. So, here I was, walking up to his door with a big smile on my face, ready to take home our new bikes. But, as I reached up to knock on the door, I felt a sharp pain on my cheek. A wasp had stung me, and my face immediately started to sting and gradually swell up. I let out a yelp of pain and stumbled back, trying to brush away the wasp. I could feel my cheek getting bigger and bigger, harder and harder, and I knew that I must have looked ridiculous, but I didn't want to let a little wasp sting ruin my or my son's excitement. So I took a deep breath, tried to ignore the pain, and knocked on the door. To say that Bayes 1013 was shocked when he opened the door would be an understatement. He took one look at my swollen face, and his eyes widened in surprise. Oh my goodness, are you okay? He asked, concern all over his face. I couldn't help but let out a laugh in pain, 
which sounded more like a wheeze due to my swollen cheek. Yeah, I got stung by a wasp on my way here, but I'm fine. Thank you for asking. Bayes 1013 laughed his head off and started shaking his head in disappointment. Well, I've never had someone show up with a puffy face to collect bikes before. Come on in, let me get some ice for that. I followed him into the house, trying not to let my swollen face get the best of me. Bayes 1013 handed me a bag of ice and I held it against my cheek, feeling the numbness start to set in. I'm sorry about this, I said, feeling embarrassed. Bayes 1013 just laughed and shook his head. No need to apologize. Accidents happen. I couldn't help but join in the laughter. I guess I can see how it might have looked that way. But no, I'm here for the bikes, if you don't mind. I'll just load them up and be on my way. Bayes 1013 nodded and led me to his garage where the bikes were waiting. As I inspected them, I could see that they were indeed in good condition. I couldn't believe my luck, but also my bad luck at the same time. A wasp sting, a swollen face, cheeks, and almost airways, got me two free mountain bikes, just like that. I had to ask, why are you giving these away for free? I couldn't help but inquire. Bayes 1013's expression turned serious for a moment before he sighed. Well, these bikes belong to my son. He was an avid biker, but he passed away last year. I couldn't bear to see these bikes go to waste, so I decided to give them away to someone who would appreciate them. In that moment, the sadness left my body the sadness and the pain of the wasting, and instead, I just felt bad for him. I couldn't imagine the pain that he was feeling. I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to use bikes and honor your son's memory. Bayes 1013 nodded. His eyes glistened with tears as my cheeks seemed to get even bigger, making it almost impossible now for me to speak. I promised that I would have thanked him once again before loading the bikes into my truck. As I drove home to my son, I reflected on the events of the day. From the excitement of finding free bikes to the unexpected wasting, and finally learning the heartbreaking story behind the generosity of Bayes 1013. But most of all, I was grateful for the reminder to never take anything for granted. Life is unpredictable, and we should cherish each moment and make the most of every opportunity that comes our way. I knew that every time my son and I rode bikes, we would be reminded of the kindness and generosity of Bayes 1013 and his son's love for biking. Oh. And that damn wasting. That wasn't fun either. I once had a friend called Niccolo. He was the type of guy that would go on adventures, leave his family for months on end, and never tell you where he was going. As he grew older, all of this caught up with him, and after a while, he decided to go to Spain and try and live it up in the mountains. The last thing I heard of him was around 2014, this was three years after he had left. He rarely ever logged into Facebook, and barely ever spoke to any of his friends on there. 
we were all left in the dark as to where he was and what he was actually doing. Niccolo was the type of guy that would just run around all day. He would run in the fields, run in the mountains, run while it's raining, while it's snowing, and while it's boiling hot. He would run barefoot, with trainers, spikes, sandals. Yeah, this guy was crazy, but that's how I was his friend. You know, sometimes, when you're crazy, you attract crazy. And all you and your crazy friends can stay together, and just relate to one another. This is what I found myself doing with Niccolo. When I first met him in my hometown, I found him in a college. It was at college that I met him and started talking with him. At first it was difficult to talk to him, as he suffers from autism and is pretty bad at communicating. But, as the days went on, we started hanging out a lot more, and then eventually, we started going on some runs together. After a while, I realised that I really liked this guy. Not in a relationship kind of way, but just as a friend. Male, 28. I guess I should have probably put that at the beginning. But now that I'm in the middle of typing, oh well. When Nicolo went to Spain, I was worried, but at the same time, I'm not his damn father, so I can't control his life, or give him stupid advice, like, stay out of trouble, don't go there, you shouldn't do that, that's too dangerous. I let him be, and allowed him to live his life the best way he wanted to, on his own terms. The only problem with this was that Niccolo was pretty lost. He didn't know what he wanted to do in life, and he sure as hell didn't want to get a full-time job and commit like the rest of us were. Committing to a job in his eyes meant that you were selling your soul. It meant that you were basically just giving up with everything. I don't see it as that, but I guess he just has a different perspective even if we were quite thinking of alike. Niccolo came back around 2016. He looked around 50 years older and had lost a whole bunch of weight. At this point, he'd lost all his hair, grown out a massive beard, and looked extremely skinny. Looking at him was pretty uncomfortable for me, and I tried to get him some help by contacting his parents. His parents tried to help, but Niccolo was refusing, and decided to go live by himself in some apartment complex around 10 miles from where I lived. This was his hometown where he always grew up. His parents only lived down the road from me, and the college that we both attended was around 3 miles away. But he didn't want anything to do with anyone anymore, except me. Occasionally, he'd feel comfortable with me meeting up with him. We'd go on runs as much as I didn't want to, but that seemed to be the only reason and way that he'd feel comfortable meeting up with me. After I finally convinced him to start getting his health back on track, a week or two went by and he started to look a lot more healthy. I decided to send him a couple hundred bucks and told him to eat more food. That seemed to work, as by week two he was definitely looking a bit more filled out in his face area. The next thing I worried about was money. Obviously, if he was going to continue eating healthily, he would need food. He was in some type of a shelter. It was during a place where they had renovated a massive apartment complex. Some guy who was the owner felt sorry for homeless people and decided to turn it into a shelter, first come first serve, run by volunteers. It wasn't very busy, surprisingly. There's not very many homeless people around this area. His parents went there multiple times, begging him to leave it and come and live back at home with them. But he refused, and at one point, his dad even tried to pull him out, and things got pretty physical, where the police had to get involved. I had a couple of long conversations with his father. He seemed ashamed that his son was in that shelter, but there's nothing more he could do. The best bet was for them to let me do my job 
and try and convince him to get his life back on track. Three weeks after he had been in the shelter, I decided to focus on money with him. I'm no entrepreneur, I'm no tech guru, and I don't run a business of my own. But what I was willing to do was help him. The first thing Niccolo did was get a job at a convenience store. He quickly lost his job when he turned up on the third shift in a pair of sandals and nothing but a short pair of running shorts. Yeah, the manager didn't like it, and I think he was creeping out some of the customers and some of the young kids in the store, so they decided to strike him off and tell him to leave. He had saved up around only 50 to $80. I don't know where the rest of the money went, but according to him, he didn't get paid it, which was kind of weird. The next thing we focused on was allowing him to do odd jobs. We started by putting an ad up on Craigslist. Niccolo's a pretty good handyman. He knows how to paint, build things, and make things. He also knows how to fix things that are broken. We decided to put an ad up as a simple title of Handy-Man. The idea was to try and get someone to help him get on his feet and employ him to do odd jobs around the house. Niccolo was fine with doing virtually anything except cleaning jobs. He hated the idea of cleaning, even though I did try to convince him that we'd have to accept cleaning jobs if it came to that. A few people started reaching out to his Craigslist ad, and before I knew it, he had got a bunch of clients. Niccolo took over, and I decided to give him the numbers of all the people that replied to the ad, seeing as I was the person that posted the ad in the first place. Eventually, the ad became so successful that I came up with the idea of deleting it and telling Niccolo to start his own one using his own laptop. He'd had this laptop since 2012. It was so old that it could barely connect to the shelter's Wi-Fi, which was kind of funny. Going to the shelter was uncomfortable. I didn't enjoy it as there were a bunch of weird people there that were of course addicts. There were only around 10 of the already 50 rooms completely empty. But at this point, that was the last of our concerns. I'd never been one to help the homeless. I don't feel bad to say that. As sometimes, the ones I've come across have been horrible and don't seem to want to help themselves. At first, Niccolo was like that, but now he seemed to change. Things were on the up, and he was actually earning himself hundreds of dollars per week, which was pretty impressive. He made a dumb decision though. Now he had quite a bit of money saved up. He decided to go rent an apartment for over one grand per month. This meant that he basically went and destroyed his entire bank balance, and went back to zero for the sake of not moving back in with his parents, who he literally said to me, he doesn't even hate. If you don't hate them, but you don't love them, then why not live with them? Uh, I don't want to, was his response every single time. You've just lived with a bunch of homeless addicts, and you'd pick them over your own family? He turned around when I said that. I think it struck a heart chord and we both went quiet from then on out. Some of the jobs he was getting were kind of weird. One was building a treehouse in a family's backyard. The next one was cleaning out a fish pond, then taking care of someone's dog, building a wardrobe, building a bed, dismantling furniture, transporting furniture, and so on. After paying out his rent, he also invested in buying a work van, where he put a bunch of stickers on. I won't name his business name, as I know that would be a stupid idea with the kind of people that go on the internet. The jobs came flooding in on his new ad on Craigslist, and before I knew it, every time I was meeting up with Niccolo, he had a new job and a hundred more people queuing for his clientele. At first, I thought that this was a good thing, but it turned out to be a very, very bad thing. I hadn't heard from him for a couple of weeks and I started to get a little worried. I decided to give him a shout by just ringing his phone, but it didn't even ring. 
no one picked up, and the signal clearly didn't get through. That's funny. Maybe he didn't have his phone on. But I tried again later that evening, and the exact same thing happened. Then, I tried again, the next day. It didn't matter how long I left it, the same thing continued to happen over and over again. It got to the point where I realised he's either got a new phone, or something really bad has happened to him. I went down to his apartment, and found that his van was no longer there, and neither was he. I knocked on his neighbour's door, and they said that he hadn't been in for over five days. This is when I started to think, okay, what's going on here? Something clearly isn't right. I decided to contact his family, who at this point had absolutely no idea that he was even working this way, let alone where his whereabouts was. They told me that I was now somehow closer to him than they were, so, in my eyes, during that call, the responsibility fell on me to try and find out where he was. I decided that I was going to first try going back to the shelter, as if by some random chance he decided to give up, sell everything, and just go back there. When I went to the shelter, I asked the workers who knew and remembered Niccolo if he had been there, or when the last time he was there. They said that he hadn't been there in weeks, which adds up to the fact that he hadn't been there since he moved into his new place. Then, after that, I went down to the park. Niccolo spent a lot of his time there, he would sit on the benches and eat fruit like watermelon, mangoes, apples and bananas. He'd spend a lot of time by himself, barefoot at the park. But no sign of his van, and absolutely no sign of him anywhere. Then, after that, I looked at the local running club, the athletics club, the college running club, and the college itself. I contacted every possible person I could think of, and still there was no signs of anyone. That's when I realised that I needed to contact the police, as at this point I had no other options. I reached out to the police and filed a non-emergency complaint, saying that I didn't know where my friend was, and I'm pretty sure I was the last point of contact with anyone who knows him. The police started looking for him by investigating deeper where he could have gone, after four weeks, there was still no sign of him, and eventually, with the access permission of the landlord, the police were allowed to enter into the apartment to do a search for his, some of his belongings. In his belongings, they found his phone, they turned it on, and all the missed calls from me were showing up. But what also showed up was a bunch of communications from random people. As the police read through it all, they said it was pretty obvious that these were people he was doing jobs for, like building stuff and cleaning stuff up. But one of the text messages seemed a bit bizarre. One of them mentioned about coming over to the house and living with them for over one month. I didn't know how he would do this without telling me, but clearly he had done that. The police then took the phone and tried to track the phone. If they knew where the number was coming from, they could locate where he was. Sure enough, it took them a few days, but they managed to do it. They located where the sender had sent those messages from, and it pinged up to a house 18 miles away. They went to the house, and found that it was inhabited by a family, three kids and a mother and a father. Where was Niccolo? According to him, he was staying in the back shed at the bottom of the garden, he was working on their large property as a handyman, except there was just one small issue. They hadn't checked on him in over 18 days. He'd had a heart attack and was dead in the shed. His body was decomposing and the family was completely oblivious.
I've been sitting on my couch for hours, completely consumed in a new TV show. As I was shifting my weight, I noticed a slight itch on my leg. I scratched it, thinking it was just a bug bite or something. I forgot about it after a while, but then as the days went by, the itch gradually got worse. At first, I tried to ignore it. I was busy with work and other obligations. I didn't have the time to worry about a little rash. I had just passed my college degree, and I would managed to secure myself a job, which was pretty surprising, considering I only just got the degree by the skin of my teeth. My mom and dad were proud. They attended my graduation. For years and years, I'd always got awful grades, Although I did barely pass the degree, I'll be honest, I was surprised that I made it, and this was the last thing I needed in my life, after a few successes. As the weeks passed, the rash seemed to spread and get even bigger. It was now covering both of my legs and was starting to become noticeable. One day, my housemate Daisy pointed it out. Hey, what's on your legs? She asked, pointing at the red, irritated skin. I shrugged, trying to play it off. Just a rash, I think. It doesn't really bother me. But Daisy was persistent. She seemed to be more worried than I was. She insisted that I go to the doctor and get it checked out. I just forgot. Life got in the way and I didn't really want to make a big deal out of it. But deep down, I kind of knew she was right. Daisy reminded me of my mum. She basically was my mum. We shared a house with three other housemates. Daisy took care of me. Whenever I was ill, she would bring me coffee and food. Whenever I was down, we'd go on walks in the park or forest. I love Daisy. She's one of my best friends, and without her, life would be a lot grayer. The rash was getting worse, and it was starting to worry me at this point, when it reached all the way up to the top of my knees. I decided to take matters into my own hands at first. I ordered some bath salts off of Craigslist from an independent supplier. I had read online that they could help with rashes and other skin diseases slash irritations, I was desperate for some relief, and the thought of soaking in a warm bath with the salts sounded like heaven. A few days later, the bath salts arrived at my house. Eagerly, once I had a free bathroom to myself for the hour, I ran the bath and made it as hot as I possibly could. I told Daisy what I was doing, and she seemed a bit confused at first, as if... I shouldn't have been doing it, over going to see the doctor. Again, looking back on things, she was most definitely, probably, no definitely, right. I poured the bath salts in, as the bathtub was now three quarters full with boiling hot water. I started inhaling the soothing lavender scents. As I sank into the warm water, I felt my muscles relax and the tension in my body start to melt away. But, after about ten minutes, I started to feel a strange sensation. It was like tiny needles pricking at my skin. I tried to ignore it, thinking it was just the salt doing their magic. But the tension only got worse, and soon turned into a full-blown itch. I couldn't take it anymore. I quickly got out of the bath, my skin now bright red and covered in hives. I started to panic, not knowing what was happening to me. Daisy heard my cries and came rushing into the bathroom. Oh my god, what happened? She said, seeing my distressed state. I don't know, the bath salts, they made it worse, I managed to say through my tears. Daisy helped me out of the tub and wrapped a towel around me. She could see the panic in my eyes, 
and knew we needed to get to hospital. She quickly grabbed her keys and we rushed out to her Toyota Corolla. As we drove to the emergency room, I could feel my whole body starting to turn red and swell. The itch was unbearable and I was starting to have trouble breathing. Daisy drove as fast as she could, but her car was old and reliable. I could feel it sputtering and struggling to keep up with our urgent pace. Please don't break down now, I whispered, fearing for my life. Thankfully, we made it to the hospital just in time. The doctors rushed me into a room and immediately started treating me for an allergic reaction. I was given antihistamines and steroids to reduce the swelling and itch. As I lay in the hospital bed, my body slowly started to calm down and the panic attack subsided. Daisy stayed by my side the whole time, holding my hand and offering words of comfort. I was grateful to have her as a friend and a housemate, especially in times like this. After a few hours, the doctors declared I was stable and I could go home. They determined that I had an allergic reaction to the bath salts and advised me to never use them again. I nodded, relieved that I hadn't suffered any long-term effects. As Daisy drove me back home, I felt lucky with what I had done. The situation could have been much worse if it wasn't for her quick thinking and her trusty, old Toyota Corolla. Once we got back, I promised myself to never order anything off of Craigslist again. I also made a mental note to always listen to Daisy's concerns, no matter how small they may seem. I learned my lesson, and now I have a newfound appreciation for my own health and well-being. Oh, and by the way, the rashes at the bottom of my legs were psoriasis. I took some medicine, and after three weeks, it went away. It's never come back. Hey guys, thank you for listening to tonight's horror stories. If you enjoyed this video and you want to support the channel, please leave a like. Also, consider subscribing if this is your first time here. On this channel, I try to upload every single night. It's always new stories, never old ones. Also, I use my real voice. I don't use AI like a lot of the other story channels do. Please be cautious when you come to choosing which channels to listen to. As I've said before, using your view is like voting on YouTube. It tells YouTube which channel you want its algorithms to promote. So if you spend all your time listening to AI channels, then that's what they'll promote. Please be careful. Please continue supporting my channel and other real horror story channels. Thank you, and I'll catch you in tomorrow's video.